Uh, great, thank you. Um, so welcome to uh, the next one and a half hours, uh, and we will be talking about uh, ethics and compliance. The one and a half hours will be split into two panels of 45 minutes each. So this is our first uh, panel here. Um, the way that uh, we will uh, try to do it is that for each panel, we will have two rounds of questions. And then as uh, mentioned, there is the QR code. So if you wish to ask a question, uh, please use it to do so. And we will try to have some time at the end for your questions. Um, so as you can see, we have for this first panel of uh, three panelists, we have uh, Kamel Ayadi, who's here in the center, who is an international consultant and former minister of anti-corruption and governance. And he is also Globe Ethics MENA regional consul amongst other things. <laughs> uh, we have Malika Parin, who is senior advisor to the director general of the WHO. And next to me, we have uh, Maximilien Roche, who is founder of Rock Integrity and Investigations, among other things. They all have very rich backgrounds uh, that they will tell you about uh, a little bit uh, uh, by themselves because they, they can do a better job than me. Uh, so uh, also in the interest of time, I will just dive into the first question, <laughs> uh, which is the same for all three, okay? Um, so, could you please uh, briefly explain uh, your role or background to us so we have a better understanding of where you're coming from and tell us what do uh, the words ethics and compliance mean to you? What do they inspire you? And uh, interestingly, uh, do you see ethics and compliance as two separate topics or do they go hand in hand? And uh, relatedly, uh, where would you say, uh, or can we even draw the line between these two topics of ethics and compliance? Thank you for these three questions in one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, indeed I am WHO uh, Director General Senior Advisor on Ethics, uh, partially, but uh, I, I lecture a lot on ethics and anti-corruption in, uh, in different contexts. And my story starts by a decade of fighting corruption in aid and being an auditor and an investigator on a corruption scheme. And ultimately being a practitioner, I became a lecturer. And um, I started at the International Anti-Corruption Academy. Why? Because it's a group of uh, police officers, investigators, auditors. And why, do I, uh, opt why did I opt for that kind of teaching? Because when you lecture on how to deconstruct a corruption scheme, you give them a new you explain how to construct a corruption scheme. So I realized while teaching on anti-corruption that there is no way you can educate on corruption scheme if you don't combine to ethics. So that's how I started to, to work on ethics in different capacities. I have to say that when I was invited to, to come to this conference, I had clarity on my message. But more I listened to the different panel, <laughs> more I get confused. <laughs> I think it's the beauty of such conversation because it does challenge the, 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 the thinking. And um, so what is the definition you are looking for ethics? I, I would say I understand that the organizer of Globe Ethics is the largest provider on open data library on ethics. So um, I was said 3.5 million download on, on ethics and congratulations to Globe Ethics for that. So somehow, if you want a definition, no doubt you will find a definition in the database of Globe Ethics. But when it comes to ethics, when I need to explain to my sisters, for instance, what is ethics, of course, people look at ethics as being a glamorous work. Oh, you do ethics, it's glamorous. You speak of philosophy, philology, um, morality, etc. Technically, the ethics portfolio in international organization is very uh, technical, we'll look at that later on. So I use this anecdote. You find a wallet with 10 euros, 10 Swiss francs, 10 dollars in the toilet, let's say. What do you do? There is no ID card and no witness. What do you do with the wallet? Do you bring it to the police station or to the office of the forgotten items? Do you keep it for yourself? There is no witness and no ID card in the wallet. Or do you assume that the person who lost it will find a way to find the wallet? Whatever the response is, I would say the rationalization you have used to decide what to do would, will codify your, your personal ethical framework. So that's, that's the kind of things uh, I, I would uh, re refer to. So 
you, to your last question on the, the line between ethic compliance, I think from my experience in the UN system, there is a real difference between ethics and compliance we'll look at later on. But uh, technically, um, ethics and compliance are two different portfolios. So we will look at that later on. Thank you, Malika. Yes, please go ahead. Th thank you very much for the opportunity to speak uh, on this uh, highly topical issue. Uh, I'm a former civil servant and uh, I worked as a technocrat and a policy maker in various fields, including uh, uh, governance and anti-corruption. I worked also in civil society work and uh, I have led a number of global initiatives uh, in uh, developing anti-corruption efforts throughout the world. So to return to your question about uh, the line between ethics and uh, compliance, we hear often uh, about the reconciliation between compliance and ethics. And I wouldn't uh, say that uh, compliance and ethics uh, need to be reconciled as there is no antagonism between both of them. They complement each other. They need to be combined and brought together to guide human behaviors towards desirable actions. So ethics and compliance, they pursue the same goal. This goal is to guide human behaviors, particularly in areas where the risk of uh, misconduct is high. But ethics and compliance, they act through different approaches. Ethics is about uh, doing things right, whereas compliance is about doing the right things. So in the context of anti-corruption, compliance and ethics, they work toward, towards uh, uh, promoting anti-corruption efforts, but they work from different, they use different paths. Ethics relies much more on uh, individuals and uh, voluntary adherence to principles, whereas compliance relies more on rules and procedures, and of course, they use coercion. I'm talking about uh, if, uh, compliance on the broad sense of the term, compliance which is much more attached with enforcement and rules and procedure and so on. So we know that relying too much on, uh, on uh, ethics could be Ethiopian. We need to hold people accountable to some rules. But the dilemma, the question that we face when we design anti-corruption programs and policy, to what extent we can rely on uh, uh, compliance, on rules. Because for policymakers, it's easy, it's easier to draw plan, uh, action plans to fight corruption relying on uh, rules. But they do, by doing so, they underestimate the cost of uh, the excessive reliance on rules. And by cost, I mean the collateral damage, not the cost of resources, because relying too much on rules and procedure can make the management complex. Adding much more rules in the management is uh, time consuming and it's less efficient. And sometimes it could be disastrous. And I'm speaking from experience because I have tried to understand, to, to study the collateral damage that, that, uh, that policy, anti-corruption policy relying on too much on rules can cause. So uh, co uh, compliance, uh, compliance programs was brought uh, two or three decades ago after the wave of prosecutions of uh, high ranking officials and the companies. And let me just uh, tell you how uh, visionaries, chief executive officers of company view the interaction between compliance and ethics in their company. I'm talking about visionaries because in my life I have uh, encountered some visionaries chief executive officer, when they were pushed to adopt compliance program after undergoing a number of difficult circumstances, and I can give you the example where I worked on with uh, Siemens, 
30 years ago when they adopted the compliance program. The visionary leaders, they stated it clearly from early beginning that uh, compliance could be only a short-term solution, and that the, the long-term solution should be programs based on integrity and ethics. And uh, the company should uh, be able within a reasonable time frame to substitute the culture of compliance with a culture of integrity and ethics. So nowadays, the problem is we know that uh, the line between compliance and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and ethics, uh, they need to be brought together. But the problem, how we can design program that rely on both and what would be the optimum? Because it's easy to put ourselves in different side to be extremist, but to know where we put the cursor, that is difficult. The optimal, this is difficult. So this is there is no formula in this. This is uh, depends on the culture and the specific context of the country, on the specific context of uh, the company to draw its program based on compliance and rules. Knowing that compliance could sure solve the problem in a short term, but if we wanted to be successful, we needed to be within a reasonable time frame, uh, substitute uh, compliance with uh, integrity. Otherwise, the cost will be heavy. Perhaps it's not obvious for some countries, but in many countries, and the, I have done some study in this, uh, relying too much on compliance, on prosecution, on legals, would be very dangerous for sometimes because it could lead to a number of deviations and of uh, uh, political anti-corruption political programs, particularly when the anti-corruption policies are driven by political purpose. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I'm I'm not going to certainly not going to disagree with my uh, co-panelist. Uh, my name is Maximilien Roche. I'm uh, um, a lawyer by training, so I like to define concepts. So I'm very happy to be on this panel. Uh, I'm also a forensic investigator since early in my career, and uh, I've been also a compliance professional uh, in the for-profit sector, in the non-for-profit sector. Uh, and today I, I'm an independent consultant and I support uh, board members and compliance officers. To, to help them uh, um, in their compliance practice. And also as, as Malika, I'm also trying to spend as much time as I can on the side uh, teaching and thinking about um, particularly white collar crime. Um, to me, ethics and compliance are of course related and, and sometimes even they're used, uh, you know, um, one is used for the other, uh, you have, uh, people in, in, in companies who are chief ethics officer or chief integrity officer, but in fact, what they're doing all day is compliance. Uh, so, but, but we are uh, trying to distinguish between the two. So I'm gonna try to, to think how we can draw a line. Uh, I think we can draw a line, but this has already been said uh, along two dimensions. Uh, one is, um, so first of all, what, what do they have in common? This has been already said by Kamal. There are reference frameworks for decision, decision making. You refer to ethics or you refer to compliance when you need to know, should I do this or should I not do this? Um, so reference framework for de de decision making, but they have two different sources. One is um, more moralistic, it's more value-based. Ethics is more value-based and moralistic. And compliance is more, what, what does the official text tells me? What does the law tells me? And the other is, why do we do this? So ethics is more self-imposed. It's, it's an in, intentional decision, while compliance is, is imposed by outside uh, you know, stakeholders, either the, the, the country where you operate, or sometimes it can even be a contract. Um, so ethics is about doing what is right. And by that is basically deciding when you have a decision to make between what is good for you, what will create more, what is going in your interest, what will, if you're a company, 
what will get you the most money, basically, and what is creating harm to others. So what economists call uh, negative externalities. So you, you have to think about the impact of your decisions on stakeholders and decide, okay, uh, if I do this, I optimize my situation at the expense potentially of others. So there is a trade-off here, how much you pay your employees, how much you pay your vendors, uh, how much you spend on uh, toxic waste, that kind of thing. And for that, of course, there is, there is an ethical response and a compliance response. And today, you know, you have a lot of convergence uh, because compliance frameworks, they exist to, to, to push individuals, companies, NGOs to do things uh, by taking into consideration their negative externalities, the impact they have on communities. But so in, in many situations, doing the ethical thing and doing the compliant thing is, th is the same, but not always. Uh, if you're a compliance officer, you're, you're spending a lot of your time, especially over the past two years, dealing with sanctions and export control. And to me, this is, you know, ethically neutral. Whose country do you do business with? This is not an ethical question, but this is a very much of a compliance topic because our com the compliance framework that applies to companies in Switzerland is you do business with countries which the Swiss government authorizes you to do business with, or at, or at least you don't do business with countries uh, and you don't deal in certain uh, um, goods with certain countries or with certain individuals. This is compliance. This is arguably not an ethical uh, issue, but this is still part of your compliance life. So most of the time compliance and ethics converge, but not always. Okay, thank you for those different yet similar answers, I guess, <laughs> if I have to just uh, quickly um, summarize. Um, so the second question is uh, kind of um, understanding um, the trajectory of ethics and, and compliance. So um, based on your experience, how has the approach uh, towards ethics and compliance evolved over time? And uh, probably, uh, um, importantly, how do you expect it to evolve uh, going forward? What are some of the stakes that we might, uh, that we should uh, keep in mind? So thank you for, for the second round of question. Before answering, uh, I will uh, add some comments from the, the first question. My experience is mainly with the UN system and international organization, and definitely in the UN system, ethics is not compliance. You have perimeter for ethics in ethics portfolio and perimeter for compliance, and most organizations don't have the two, two portfolio in the same office. The ethics perimeter in most of UN organizations relates to ethics advice on conflict of interest, declaration of interest, financial disclosure, that kind of things. Of course, training, training on ethical decision, uh, meaning um, educating colleagues on what is unethical, because everybody would agree on what is ethical, and ethical decision making is described often in code of ethics. But technically, the way to better understand and to own the notion of ethical decision uh, it's to understand what is the mechanism for taking an unethical decision, why good people take bad decisions, and to work on cases, real cases, to, to transform the organization in a more ethical organization. So having said that and understanding that the perimeter is very much defined in a technical portfolio, it's not about philosophy and reflecting on morality and good things. It's really to put, it's about putting in action a variety of mechanism which relate to the code of ethics or code of conduct. So in terms of, um, in terms of trajectory, I would say um, the 90s was about integrity. The buzzword of the 90s was integrity. The buzzword of the 2000 decade was accountability. And uh, the, day, the buzzword of the 2010 decade was uh, transparency with the syndrome of hyper transparency at the end of the decade of 2010. Getting, for instance, organization putting on their website their audit report, investigation report, this level of hyper transparency, definitively the ongoing decade is about ethics. Because in most industries, ethics is close to compliance. I could say it's the decade of ethics and compliance, although I'm still convinced that that's two different businesses. So in, in that trajectory, as you rightly described, Siemens business case is an amazing reference one 
which has uh, very much influenced the, the new generation of compliance officer because they have built a good compliance program based on the bad, <laughs> yeah. bad history. Um, the, the thing is, definitively, compliance has been um, exposed to a certain norms and standards internationally as a profession. You could look at International Institute of Auditors, they have codified compliance mechanism. While ethics has a multiplicity of good provider on ethics, but it's not organized as a profession. So the trajectory is really professionalization to build on different initiatives, which are very powerful in different continent, um, but it has to be professionalized. Why? Because ethics is navigating in the sea where you would find the accountability stakeholder, among which you would have investigation, mediation, ombuds office, um, um, staff association, um, public opinion, etc. And in this accountability framework, we cannot say that the profession is regularized in a, in a clear and shared manner across continent. Of course, there are very well known businesses and initiatives to organize the profession of ethic and compliance officer, but it's codified along technical perimeter given in the given context, in the given continent. Uh, in some international organization, the chief ethics officer will have to give an opinion, for instance, on the maturity of the risk universe of the organization, while in other organization, it's much more the compliance officer who would do so. So, of course, uh, it's easy to say it depends, but it really depends on the industry, how the ethics portfolio is uh, addressed in the given industry, and what is the perimeter of that business and how the profession can, can be organized uh, along that. Um, then to answer to the last part of your second question, um, the global narrative we could uh, hear yesterday, a very inspiring uh, speaker on uh, the multilateralism 2.0, the, the new alternative to multilateralism. The global narrative is about multilateralism. The reality is about fragmentation. And the question is, we can aim at having a new version to multilateralism because there is no other option, but the reality we observe every day in the business, in the world is fragmentation. And ethics will have to dedicate more thinking on the impact of fragmentation on the labor market in the business context. That's my view. Thank you. Thank you for this question. There is a lot to say about this, but before going to your question, I want to just to elaborate on what Melika said. Just uh, there is a, a critical question when we talk about uh, compliance and ethics, which is trust. When we don't trust people, we put measures, we put rules, rules to control them. So the critical determinant of the size of a compliance program is the level of trust. And usually what we do in companies, we try to uh, diagnose the integrity system. We spot the gaps through which corruption can occur, talking about corruption. Then we will fill these gaps with procedure and we will make the compliance program bigger. And here is the problem because uh, we cannot uh, substitute rules and compliance to trust. When we have a problem of trust, we need to restore trust. We need to, to create a culture of trust with values and the principles, not to substitute the trust with the compliance and with the rules. So coming, uh, coming to your uh, question, I will answer always based on my experience in fighting corruption, because this is where I see the ethics and compliance in practice. So, the fight against corruption has undergone three major phases. The first phase was uh, over the past three decades. The first phase was uh, uh, awareness raising with the emergence of international uh, NGOs such as Transparency International, uh, the emergence of uh, metrics to highlight the cost and the, to quantify the damage of uh, corruption all of this was to push the international community to put the issue of corruption on the agenda. The second phase was the emergence of um, legal instruments, 
then corruption was criminalized all over the world. And the third, and the, then uh, prosecution of uh, international companies and the high level officials took place. And the third was the emergence of uh, the management tools to address corruption. And I worked with a number of them, the ISO standards to address uh, corruption. But today with the hindsight, and after three decades, there is a consensus that all of this was not enough to address corruption. And nobody can tell you the, op the contrary of this. And the reason, and the, we are looking for, not for alternative solutions, because these solutions should remain, but they are not enough. We are looking for alternative, we are looking for approaches based on integrity and the ethics. And what we have noticed also that uh, countries which have relied too much on prosecution and enforcement, they failed to address corruption. I can give you and the most famous example, which is the uh, clean hands investigation that took place in Italy in 1990, in, in 40 years ago, 36 years, 35 years ago. More than 800 people, high level officers, uh, including uh, ministers and the two former ministers were uh, jailed, were indicted and convicted, more than 800, including uh, parliamentarians and senators and so on. A few years later, the corruption has increased again. And it's not only the persistence of corruption, but the normalization of corruption, because the, the convicted former prime minister Berlusconi won the election again. So this is what can happen when you rely too much on enforcement and compliance and to, uh, in, in the legal system because you, it can lead to the normalization of corruption because the second, there are a lot, uh, a lot of other examples. Another example is the Lavajato in Latin America, more than 800 people also jailed, but the corruption has increased. So nowadays we look for solutions that uh, uh, solution combined with rules and compliance, but with, uh, uh, with, uh, with ethics and uh, integrity. And I would say today that uh, there is an unprecedented opportunity for, to position global ethics and to position people like those who are working on uh, ethics to lead the world because the world is looking for solution not classical solutions solution that are based on ethics, based on uh, integrity. I have done some research before coming to this uh, conference to see uh, the, uh, and I, do, I, I, I did some research on 100 websites through uh, artificial intelligence. What is the most frequently recurring word that comes with the, the most contemporary challenge such as such as artificial intelligence uh, sustainable development corruption and i found i found that for uh, artificial intelligence the word that comes often in 100 website is ethics with 30% the second is uh, human rights 20% the third is employment, 15%. The fourth is vice, 10%, and, you, and the rule uh, regulation, 10%. Of course, this, uh, apart from the technical words, like uh, uh, all the technical neural network, deep learning, et cetera, et cetera. I did the same research 25 years ago when we start talking about the emergence of ICT, and uh, well, uh, when Geneva hosted in 2003, the World Summit on the Information Society, I was part of the organization of that summit uh, within the United Nations. And uh, I found that ethics was only mentioned 5%. So we see that uh, after 50, uh, 20, 20 years, ethics is the source of solution for the contemporary challenges. So this is an opportunity. I will terminate with this. But we have to change. It's good that uh, to spread uh, ethics uh, education everywhere. But this is part of the solution. This is marvelous, but this is part of the solution. We should also target professionals. And when you target professionals, you won't teach them uh, ethics, uh, uh, theoretical ethics, the ethics of Spinoza or uh, Kant. They need professionals, they need the tools. If you teach them, in, the, in my experience, I have 
done a lot of training for professionals. If you teach them about ethics, theoretical ethics, they will look at it as uh, romantic, as Ethiopian, because these people are working in a greedy world. So they need heavy weapon. For this reason, people see that uh, we can only end corruption with uh, heavy weapon like uh, prosecution and so on, but prosecution failed to uh, end the corruption, although it's important because prosecution is important to end the impunity. So nowadays we need to come up with some tools. Managers and professionals, they need tools to integrate tools. They don't need just theoretical knowledge. So this is uh, just a con if it could be uh, considered by Globe Ethics to target professionals. They are looking for, they, they are aware that we cannot solve the problems that the world is facing with the classical uh, approaches, that we need the new approaches based on human behavior, based on ethics, but we need to, to try to find the appropriate way to sell this knowledge, but in a different way, because managers, they, they, they understand the language of tools and the management. They don't understand the language of, uh, the, of theoretical knowledge and the, uh, of, uh, uh, and the rhetoric. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. That was a powerful speech. Um, you actually answered one of, uh, of the other questions that I had already, so no need to ask it. Okay, so uh, Max, go ahead. Thank you. And again, I'm probably going to repeat what has already been said, but with a different angle. Uh, I, I think the, the, the perception of compliance has evolved over the past 20 years, even 30 years, in, in, in connection with how you know, the word grew more complex. Uh, let, let me explain by analogy to our individual behavior. In my, in my parents' generation, 30 years ago, it was easier to ignore the, the consequences of our inter, in, individual consumption decisions. It was easier not to think about who is manufacturing or clothes or about what's gonna happen with my plastic straw, straw when I throw it uh, away. Because we didn't, th th at 30 years ago, we had little visibility on the world around us. We were only focusing on the immediate, uh, our immediate surroundings. Uh, it's, it's the same for, 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 for companies. 30 years ago, it was you know the Milton Friedman economy, greed is good, it's important to uh, uh, focus on, on making profits. You have a, 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 a duty to your shareholders to, to maximize your profits. Today, we live in a, more, in, in, in a world that is more complex. We have more visibility on, on supply chains, on the, on the impact of our actions. And, and it's, the, it's the same thing for companies, for NGOs. It, it's more complicated. So of course, you have compliance, you have regulations, you have an inflation of regulation that are here to guide our choices and try to optimize them and make sure that when we, when, when companies, uh, you know, make money, they don't create too much damage or they, 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 they try to limit the, the impact they have. And that's, that's the compliance, that's sustainability, whatever you want to call it, but that's a, a framework to help guide organizations to, to make sure that they, they, um, have a, a limited impact on their stakeholders. But uh, so this, this lesson has been learned the hard way uh, through you know, scandals that have been discussed already. Uh, it, it's, you, have, you had scandals even in the non-for-profit sector. Uh, I don't know if you followed the uh, Oxfam scandal in, in 2017. You had a, a scandal with WWF in 2019. Yeah, you have a lot of scandals also in organizations which are not profit seeking. They're not looking to maximize their profit, but they're just not conscious of the, the, the impact they have on, on their, the communities where they operate. So more and more, you have rules that complexify the situation, but also you have individuals who want to be more ethical because they understand the consequences of their actions. So as a compliance professional, I've been approached more and more by people in even without rule that come to me and say, hey, I wanna do this new thing. I wanna try this uh, new approach. Um, do you see any, any problem with that? Do, do, do you see what the impact will be? And that's for me, that's a, a good sign that people are being more ethical. 
not necessarily because they're becoming better, better people, but because they're better informed that what they're doing at their, at their level can have uh, impact on others and, and impact stakeholders. Great, thank you. Um, so cannot answer all the questions that are here, but um, uh, we have time for one, I guess. Um, and it's a one about trade-offs, which I always find interesting. I don't know if uh, you have uh, something to say about that, but um, so it's trade-offs between uh, implementing compliance in a company, but that can somehow result in unethical behavior because you're trying to follow the rules. So to, okay, Malika has something to, to make short the uh, long story. That's what we call lawful, but awful. <laughs> I, I think it's a very well-known concept in the compliance uh, environment. Yes, indeed, compliance is compliance with the rule of law, and sometimes the rule of law, the procedure, the policy, the standard, ISO, etc. But uh, as far as it's the compliance with standard policy and procedures, it can be awful. What makes the challenge interesting is when you add in the corpus of compliance the element of ethics compliance with the mission, the values, the statement. And then it's not anymore lawful, but lawful, it will be lawful and ethical. That's my short answer. I think uh, the ideal, but it's the theoretical assumption, is to live without compliance not compliance, not compliance that uh, have for ob of objective to prevent the wrongdoing because we comply to the rules, to the normal rules. This is normal, there is no problem. But when you put uh, compliance rules just to prevent wrongdoing, if people are in, uh, honest enough, they can prevent wrongdoing themselves because they will do the right things. So the best, the best program is to know how to reach the optimum between, uh, because uh, if you put less compliance, you can create uh, gaps through which corruption and wrongdoings in general can occur. If you build a robust sub, uh, compliance program, you will have the opposite. So we need to, to know the culture, the ethical culture of the company. And through the ethical culture, you can build your compliance program. I received a number of uh, professionals in training. And from a small discussion, I can understand the culture of company. It's, it's the, the things that you can notice the first. When you talk about people in company is to detect the culture of the company. So working on the culture of company will, of course, you will, of course, need all, all the time compliance because there, is, there will be always rules that you need to, to comply with, not to, to prevent wrongdoing, but to, to do things as, it, as they are planned in the organization. And this optimum is, uh, as I said, is something that it's not easy to define. It's, uh, I, um, sometimes uh, there are some countries, company, they import uh, experts just to, to put for them compliance program, which work in another, uh, in another company. It doesn't work like this. You have to create your own compliance program based on the culture of the organization. Thank you. Uh, just you, you mentioned trade-off and I'm gonna be very, very fast here, but yeah, it's a, tr it's a trade-off. If you wanna do things, if you wanna take other, other stakeholders' interest other than your own, you will have to leave money on the table. And that I think Laurence uh, said, said it yesterday, the, in some cases, there are no consequences to unethical decisions, meaning you will maximize your, uh, your profit at the expense of others, but no one will, will, will force you to do otherwise. So, uh, of course, if you want to, it, it, ethics is self-imposed. It's, it, it's, it has to be um, self-imposed in the sense that you have to feel like it's, it's the right thing to do. It's, it has to be valued in your culture. I'm not going to do this, even if that would make me richer, because that's not how things are done here. So it's 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 a culture thing, but it, it's also in an organization. It's not also not only about the, the about the incentives. It's also about 
the, um, you know, the how leadership behaves, leadership um, ethics, um, leadership by example. So it's not only setting a set of rules and a code, it's also creating the, the right culture. And with that, thank you very much <laughs> to the three panelists. <laughs> We're out of time. Thanks, everyone. We will now be starting the second round of panel. Moderator, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. So after having a kind of a higher level view of the topic of ethics and compliance, this one, as you can see from the title, um, uh, focuses more on the private sector. And for that, we have uh, five wonderful panelists from a, a range of companies. So we have Alexander Finger there <laughs> from uh, SAP Switzerland. He's the chief technology officer. We have Klaus uh, next to me from Novartis, who is a member of the executive committee and chief ethics, risk and compliance. Everything in one. In one. Um, we have Norman uh, Beveridge is here, uh, who uh, from the Lycra company, uh, former chief uh, ethics and compliance officer. And from the finance industry, we have two representatives. We have uh, Maria Pena, who is from Symbiotics Asset Management. She is the R Chief Risk and Compliance Officer. And last but not least, we have um, Melchior de Muralt from uh, both uh, PPT, his managing partner there, and um, co-founder of uh, at Blue Orchard Finance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So um, as I mentioned, same, uh, same deal as before, uh, two rounds of questions. The questions are the same for everyone and we will hear uh, the different takes on the questions. And then a Q&A. So we have the code here um, in case you want to ask some questions. Um, so if we just start. Uh, so for the first question, um, could you please let us know what your role is in your company? So we, we understand where you come from. And let us know a bit about how your company specifically uh, approaches ethics and compliance, how this has evolved over time. And I think what is interesting uh, to know is whether ethics um, is part of the company's DNA or if it's something that you feel is more of a uh, good to have or an add on. So I, I don't know who wants to start. I want to go in the order. Okay, just, uh, okay. No, thank you. I, I will start because I'm the finance guy. <laughs> <laughs> and finance is the most terrible beast to master and uh, to understand. Very agile, very fluid, but very difficult to, uh, to regulate. And uh, if I give the example of the Puri Pictetoritini, we are an investment uh, company managing about 7 billion, so it's a boutique. Uh, but we uh, co-founded Blue Orchard, happy to see Symbiotics here, creating uh, over 20 years the proof that we can invest with uh, a, an above the market financial rate and an impact. After 20 years, no, no one can object. Then we decided to launch um, um, a concept of funds uh, engaging with portfolio companies. I'm very uh, honored to see uh, Novartis here, but uh, we, we, we have a, a lot of uh, shareholder engagement meeting with portfolio companies trying to push a bit the boundaries and uh, to uh, play our role of shareholder. At the end, we are the fiduciary shareholders, all the shareholders of the companies, and we need to make uh, our voice. And that's where ethics will come at the end of the discussion. But now we are in the middle of a huge wave of regulation, as you understand, which I think is a very good uh, sign, but it, which is very tricky for us um, uh, in finance because uh, the European um, Commission decided to launch the SFDR, Sustainable Financial Reporting Disclosure, before the CSRD, sorry for <laughs> the jargon, huh? which is the Corporate Society Reporting Disclosure. Um, so that's a bit strange, but everybody is wanting to be fashionable, jump on the most sustainable article, eight or nine. I don't go in the detail, we could come, come back, it's a bit boring, but, uh, but at the end, what we did uh, is we 
uh, don't take it personally, but we underweighted uh, Nestle a little bit and overweighted Unilever, for instance, due to the ISS uh, ratings, which has no real impact, a little bit on boards, of course, because they want to be best in class and they will, they will act, but there is no real additionality and intentionality. So my, um, my word here, and I, I will stop there, maybe we could take uh, the discussion further, is we need, if we have an ethical angle as shareholders, somehow co-owners of the company, especially the big pension funds, huh? they are really long-term shareholders and stakeholders of listed companies. We need to uh, look at additionality. So there is a lot of data. data. Uh, there is a lot of effort uh, of companies to solve um, uh, the, uh, their value chain uh, negative externalities to enhance their positive externalities uh, in the health sector will be very interesting to, to hear you. Uh, uh, there are a lot of effort for reaching the poorest, to providing a, a health solution to the excluded and so on and so forth. But we as shareholders, we should accompany that. And I tell you uh, how uh, I believe we should do it. Geneva is the headquarter of the implementation of the SDGs. No doubt about that. Huh? We have all the uh, operational agency of the UN, the humanitarians. I have the privilege, privilege to be member of the ICRC committee. Uh, and we tried a lot with, uh, with the private sector to, to team up. So I believe that shareholders should, by one way or another, uh, engage with portfolio company on partnership and blended finance. Symbiotics is a perfect example. They know how to blend financial products uh, to achieve a, a financial and social return. So I think that's a very, uh, very important uh, dimension. And uh, uh, shareholders should not just uh, keep computing data which is the two easiest game. They tr really try to engage with portfolio companies. Com portfolio companies are willing to hear that. There are a lot of uh, signs that, uh, in any case, regulation will under regulators will understand the trick of those articles. And maybe next year or in two years' time, we might have one sustainable uh, SFDR uh, regulation, maybe another one called transition, uh, which will ask more on active stewardship. UK adopted the UK stewardship code, uh, which is quite compulsory. Switzerland recently adopted a, a, a Swiss stewardship code, meaning how do you behave as a shareholder, long-term shareholders with companies on your stewardship uh, uh, governance. So that's where I think we should uh, end up uh, the discussion, at least for the financial capital market yep. uh, view. So since there is some uh, uh, relevance between the two, maybe Maria, and then we go for the industry. Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Lila, for inviting me, and thank you to the audience, uh, because it's a uh, uh, thank you to the Global Ethics Forum for this beautiful today's uh, conference. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, I planned to say something very quickly, but um, sure you, you raised topics that are worth or worth raising. So, but first, let me first start with the what my company is doing from an ethical standpoint and whether it's on the DNA of the company. So, symbiotics. What does it mean? It's the art of connecting people to establish, cultivate, and uh, preserve. Uh, the re social relationship among members. So it's uh, embedded in the name of the company. So yes, we have uh, a social function related to finance. Uh, we try to provide the social function to finance. And uh, for that, that is included in our vision, mission and values of the company. And what is important is that we have a, a social charter where uh, we need, there are several principles that apply to all our investments and applies to all the investment process. So first principle is the geographical scope. We invest in emerging and frontier markets. 
Second one is that we invest in the real economy. What does it mean? It means that we invest through private debt and private equity, rather than investing in the social uh, in the stock exchange. Also, another important fil filter that you mentioned is the um, social rating. We use for all of our investment. We use ESG criteria. So, if there is not a social purpose in the investee, we stop. We don't invest in those companies. Uh, another important topic is that we try to uh, create a long-term value investment. There is, we don't buy and sell, we invest and we try to keep that on in the long term. Uh, something important is that we promote financial inclusion, that is through microfinance. And also we promote entrepreneurship and we promote employment through a small and medium enterprises. And to whom? We try to go there where others don't go. We go to the base of the pyramid. So to the poorest of the poorest. And that is what we, Symbiotics intends to do. Uh, maybe very quickly, let me say, uh, speak about compliance because I also have that hat. As a financial entity regulated by FIMA, we are bound to a, a code of conduct. And uh, we have several duties, fiduciary duty, uh, uh, duty of loyalty, and duty of uh, information, transparency. So we are bound to our investors. So we need to comply with all those uh, principles to make sure that uh, we, uh, the, the market it's uh, respected. A very quick word to say that from a shareholding standpoint, half of, the half of the shareholders of the company are employees of the company. The other half are friends and family. So at the end of the day, we don't have a big shareholder behind who is asking us to provide benefits, but that also creates a different atmosphere in the, in the company. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now I don't know if Alexander, we go back to you and come. Yeah, happy to continue. Yeah, thank you very much for the for the kind invitation, the opportunity to be here. Um, SAP's motto is to help the world run better and improve people's lives. And I don't know who of you know SAP. Any? Yeah, some, some don't. I, I can. I'm very confident that every. A single one of you has already been in touch with our software because we provide software for organizations to operate, to do the PNL in the end, but everything around it. So everything you need to run a company is what we provide in software. We are a 50-year-old startup from Waldorf in Germany, one of the last European big software companies. Uh, we have a global footprint. We are represented in all markets. And in fact, when I say that all of you have been in touch with us, it means that more of 90% of the products in the world go at one point or the other through an SAP system, either during production, during logistics, or during retail. And if you look into Switzerland, we have a very, very strong customer base here, and the large retailers are using SAP to fulfill their customers' needs. My role in SAP is the role of the CTO for SAP Switzerland. Um, as such, I'm dealing with innovation. So I'm talking to our own organization about innovation, freshening up the skills, introducing new technology to our own employees. And I'm having a lot of discussions with our customers, existing customers, new customers, and startups about how they can use the technology which we provide them, which is emerging, to create more value for their customers. And that's actually the, the most rewarding moment when we see that our customers are using our software to create something for their customers and moving that forward. So the answer, to your question was a bit in the in my first phrase when I said we help the world run better and improve people's lives. So ethics is part of our DNA. It's deeply rooted in the way we run our business ourselves and the way we interact with each other inside our company, but as well in the way how we interact on markets. And that makes some things very, very easy for us. Some things become more difficult. In the panel before, we heard already about diverging interests, about incentives, specifically in sales, and there are definitely things to discuss. And we invest a lot in making that happen. One last word from the CTO, because I'm the technology guy and the innovation guy. Um, 
AI has made many people aware of what software can bring as a risk. And now we are having a discussion about ethics led by AI or spearheaded by AI, which is overdue because the risks imposed by AI are very visible. We see this currently because all of you have probably tried out ChatGPT and were amazed and surprised what it can do. Ask yourselves probably, will it take my job? Will it take somebody else's jobs? But this is a discussion which is overdue for decades because software has already had these inherent risks before and software had always to be used in a, not only a compliant fashion, but in an ethical way. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, my name is Norman Beveridge and formerly the, the Chief Ethics and Compliance Officer of the Lycra Company. Uh, so I spent the last 35 years I joined as, a, as an engineer, worked in operations, sales and marketing, uh, moved to Geneva to take up a finance role, uh, also worked in the US in R&D. Uh, in 2004, reinvented myself uh, in, into compliance and been working in compliance since then. So um, we're uh, the Lycra company, we make the Lycra fiber uh, that goes into all your garments. Uh, so whether that be ready to wear, swimwear, lo uh, lingerie, um, uh, we also uh, produce fiber that goes into uh, nappies as well for the leg, 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 and the and the cuffs. We're basically in an unregulated industry, uh, and so my role to answer your your, your first question uh, is really to ensure that we have good corporate processes, that we have uh, uh, people that are well trained and know how to react. You know when uh, they, they encounter a, a sticky situation. Uh, and the why behind that is we want to protect the company, we want to protect the shareholders, we want to protect the directors of the company uh, and, and the employees uh, against reputational risk or fines, fines and penalties. So what do I do? Uh, I run or I used to run the ethics and compliance program. So starts with the code. Uh, we have uh, compliance standards across the different areas of, of law that, that, that we need to uh, comply with in our business. Uh, of course, we do our due diligence on our partners. Uh, the most important thing is pick the right partners that you want to work with. Uh, so do the, do, the, do the diligence on that. Also involved in, in investigations when things go wrong. Uh, and then one of the tools that I was, I was quite uh, pleased of running about was uh, the ECS, which is our ethic, ethical compliance scenarios. And this is where uh, we, we gave groups of people small scenarios, very simple scenarios to sit down and talk about uh, in an unthreatening way about how basically we would have a one page for the participants and one page for the leaders. Uh, and people, the teams of people would sit down and talk about these scenarios to sort of prepare them, get their sort of muscle memory. This sort of situation came, came along, this is how they would react. And then we provided a leader guide uh, so that you know if these topics didn't come up, then they should uh, reinforce them, link them back to the code of conduct, link them back to our, our compliance standards. Um, as far as the, the, the question about um, how do we approach ethics and compliance, uh, I think similar to Alex, it's, it's really, it's in our DNA. So I started back in, in, in DuPont, uh, where safety, safety compliance was uh, exceptionally important. Uh, and a little bit of history, uh, you know, DuPont's been around for a long time, but back in 1818, there was a major explosion at their explosive factory. Uh, and the leaders at, at the time then decided that the best thing to do uh, to improve the safety was to move the plant manager's house closer to the plant. And that's what they did and safety improved. So that's how the DNA, how safety got into, uh, safety compliance, safety with the EHS got into DuPont. Um, and, and then for uh, Coke Industries, um, Charles Coke, who was one of the, one of, one of the well, it, was, it was one of the key owners along with David Coke. Um, in the DNA for that company, I was very lucky that, uh, yeah, that they were able to, the tone of the top basically was all about compliance first before business. Uh, and, you know, he even, you know, Charles Coke would tell the story that he would step out of a business such as the tarmac business because he couldn't get comfortable about the corruption in the business. Uh, and so he really, he really put his money where, where his mouth was. Uh, and so for us, you know, it's, it, it was embedded there in the principles, principle one integrity, principle two compliance. And then so when Coke Industries uh, sold the Lycra business, uh, the Lycra company was formed. Uh, you know, basically we stood up the compliance program and took the best of the last couple of companies. Uh, and yeah, that's, that, that's basically how compliance evolved. Yeah, I would a little bit maybe give it a different uh, twist, to be honest. Um, 
if you talk about a leading question, maybe if, if ethics is in the DNA of a company, I mean, this is a, it's a tricky question, to be honest. Um, if you look at the pharma industry, uh, that's maybe the industry which is for the right reasons on the highest scrutiny of all industries, because we are an industry which is the closest to human life and health. Uh, and this is a great responsibility. This brings the uh, eternal ethical dilemma. Uh, can you do health for profit? That's the, basically the, um, the eternal dilemma we have in the industry. So therefore I would phrase it, if you talk about the DNA a little bit different, I would say, uh, Ethical dilemmas you know, are basically um, neighbors and, uh, and passengers in our journey in the industry from the very early uh, research, because it's an ethical question, where do you research? What are the bioethical boundaries for research? If you think about uh, cell and gene therapy, for example, over classical dilemmas like animal testing, that's by the way, a classic that you can't solve an ethical dilemma because you either hurt the animals or you stop innovation for the patients. And we just try to find the right transparency and discussion around this to handle this ethical dilemma, but you can't solve it at the time being. Maybe in 10 years, if AI allows us to do all the animal testing in AI bots or in AI sculptured animals, it's maybe a different thing. But at the moment, uh, there's a lot of science, there's not a lot of... Uh, so it's a really one of these classical... Uh, dilemmas. The other dilemmas go to the commercializing of our drugs, their manufacturing. So I would say the D DNA, I would be careful to say it's in a company. I would say you judge a company how open, honest a company addresses and discusses the ethical dilemmas. There is no perfect organization on this earth, not on the public, not on the private side. There's no perfect society. We all Part of it, so I would always say stay humble, uh, measure what do we do, how to address ethical dilemmas, how we help our people. How we approach this at Novart is a bit different as most of the companies because we said we have to support our colleagues in a more holistic way. So the problem of compliance is uh, it was in the previous panel, it's legal compliance, you need it. and the regulatory, industry, fully regulated industry and finance is the same. We know what this means. A lot of work already, but it's not sufficient. This is clear. You have risk management. At the end, you, you know, your ethical discussions give the boundaries in which risks you want to go. So you should keep risk and crisis management uh, close to you. So what we uh, did in the company and we are on this journey, what we call integrated assurance based on ethical discussions is to bring the ethics discussion, the risk management, crisis management, governance, compliance, together in one organization, which is not owning ethics. No one owns ethics in the company, but it's able to, to foster with foresight dialogue on ethical dilemmas. And you raised AI already, which definitely is for all of us an unsolved topic from an ethics point of view, huge opportunities and also risks. So this ethical, Discussion is the basis for our approach to bring risk management, crisis management, governance, compliance together to, to support the whole challenges we have in our industry more holistically. And always the advice, stay humble. Things happen in big companies always. We employ 80,000 people around the globe. We are in all countries, you can imagine. And uh, the question is, the, how do you deal with ethical topics when, when they come up? Thank you. Uh, so I will ask my uh, second question. Uh, I just don't know if there are questions from the audience. Uh, for the moment, I cannot see any. So if you have any, or if if I should be seeing and I don't see them, uh, please let me know. Um, so the second question is uh, the classic uh, challenges and opportunities question. So um, if you could let us know what are some of the um, difficulties or challenges that you encounter when we talk about ethics and, and compliance in your organization, and of course, any opportunities that you may see uh, related to those topics. Thank you. We take the same order. order. Yes, I, I have in mind a, a very stri striking example on the tension between regulation and ethics. Um, Stellantis, a, a famous uh, car company moving towards new mobility and electric vehicle is uh, um, fighting against in uh, the UK, 
uh, is uh, uh, sued uh, in the UK on um, complicity through the Slavery Act because they are sourcing to a Chinese uh, supplier in uh, RDC, uh, involuntary, of course, illegal uh, artisanal uh, cobalt. Uh, Amnesty International uh, produced a very uh, uh, deep report and the University of Geneva contributed as well with a very interesting uh, paper on that. And um, so we as uh, investors, being Article 6, eight or nine, <laughs> sorry for the, <laughs> the jargon again. Uh, if we are article six, we will just have a sort of uh, uh, very easy calculation saying that what will be the cost of the, of the lawyers to win because they will win at the end. And uh, what the benefits of having just in time, large uh, sourcing uh, of cobalt in the tough battles with the Chinese, in fact. Uh, you are Article 8, you are a little bit uh, um, in a difficult position, so you will weigh the next rating of, um, let's say, ISS. By a chance, the rating may increase due to other criteria, so the aggregated <laughs> rating might increase, so you will not change the position or decrease. You might sell a little bit your position, but that will not change at all the situation for the children, for the forest, for the fragility, the conflict uh, arising there. In Article 9, uh, having the intentionality of impact might be a little bit, uh, might be a bit more tricky. So they might or sell or start to engage. But in engaging, they mainly will ask the company to get rid of that Chinese supplier, which is a very good co company, by the way. So we had the idea we trapped into that uh, uh, corner of regulation, having no impact on the field, we decided uh, to uh, uh, join uh, some other shareholders uh, in the, in the in the, uh, industry digitalization and uh, energy transition uh, and try to uh, identify low hanging uh, formalization uh, program on cobalt, just to show the example, try to link it to the Chinese supplier or to another one, and at the end to Tesla, Stellantis, Volkswagen, and so on. Uh, companies are quite interested, and uh, so there is, and Geneva is the perfect place for doing that. Uh, we not, did not give up yet, but the story, the striking story is the following. We started to discuss with one of the biggest uh, traders on cobalt, I will not name them here, but they are full of uh, goodwill. And they had a small uh, formalization program in RDC and saying, okay, we will help you to, and we will help you in addressing SDC, USAID. A lot of DFIs would be very interested to provide technical assistance and so on. So, uh, and the head of society of that company was enthusiastic saying, ah, for, uh, at the end, there are some shareholders and financial players interested about those issues. That's a good for me. I will come back to you. I will consult the executive committee and so on. After a few months, he came back saying, OK, we decided to stop the, the formalization program. It's too risky. It showed that partnership is so important because alone, RDC is too risky, full stop. Uh, but the executive committee told me we have no and client needs. So what does that mean? It means that the shareholders are not present because at the end, the CEO here has to run the company, you know that there are regulation, compliance issue, potential fines and so on. And you know that the Chinese competition is a tough game and so on. But if the owner at the end is not pushing towards formalizing and uh, enhancing the resilience of the value chain, as shareholders, nothing will happen. And that's where I distinguish regulation because nobody in regulation is pushing toward that and ethics. And that's why I believe at the end, the next wave will be on stewardship. If you look closely to the UK uh, stewardship code, it's much more driven by transition, accompanying the transition, it being a facilitator. In Geneva, we have so many opportunities. IFC is sending uh, a guy at the ILO, to potentially um, scale up the Better Work program. I, I believe you are a member of that, which is a textile uh, uh, public-private uh, uh, initiative, 
on extraction and maybe other sectors. So there are plenty of goodwill and shareholders need to be there saying, we could help you join forces with the public sectors, true blended finance, for foundation and so on. So that's a bit my appeal of going beyond ESG, beyond regulation, true, uh, a sort of a will of ethic. <laughs> Thank you. So I guess we just keep the same order as before. Um, I think we can uh, just uh, keep the, the rest of the time for this question. And, uh, well, I, I, I will try to be uh, quick. So uh, I will leave time to the others. So maybe from for us, what is important uh, is that uh, in all, all our agreements, we have as a condition precedent, we have a, a list of exclusion uh, activities or either activities or products or financing activities or products. So what is important is that when we invest in a company, uh, they don't go through that list of uh, activities, which is alcoholic beverages, uh, it's pornography, it's uh, tobacco, it's weapons, uh, pesticide, there are several uh, uh, there is a list of activities that are not allowed. What normally happens, I think we are very lucky because at the end of the day, uh, those who raise concern about that list of ex exclusions are people who are really concerned and who read the agreements from A to C. So they, they come back from time to time with several questions because they want to do things well, maybe because they are uh, producing uh, kitchen knives or uh, things like that, that might be considered as a weapon. So we have been very, very lucky for the time being. In any case, we have the financial analysts who are on the field to, who are monitoring the investees. There is a, a regular reporting taking place. Uh, there is a, co a communication ongoing. There is data, there is reporting that is being analyzed. So that is very important to, to avoid having any trouble. Worst case scenario will be fraud. And uh, I think I'm very lucky because uh, since I work at Sambetix for 10 years, I think we only had two cases. One, it was a little bit a pity because it was a very beautiful uh, cooperative uh, where the owner, she, uh, she did such a great work that at the end of the day, she thought she could be whichever she wanted. So take the money for the wedding of his, her son or things like that. So in that cases, uh, there is, um, we, it's an event of default, again, coming back to the agreement, and that allows us to accelerate, which is really the ultimate uh, solution because we are a long-term investment company, uh, but there is the, the solution that we, uh, we, we can foresee. I leave it there, so I leave the time for yeah. my colleague. I'll try to be short as well. So obviously as a globally acting software provider, we sell software, we sell services. And the moment you have a salesperson and you, uh, I think Maximilian, this was what you referred to as well, you have an incentive for the salesperson. And depending on the personal situation of that person, there might be a conflict and the person might be tempted to do things he or she shouldn't be doing. The way we tackle this is with a lot of education, formalized education, which we document, but as well in, with a spirit in which people can speak up. Because Klaus, you said things will go wrong, so things will definitely go wrong. We are a couple of more employees, but not too many, but among this large group of people you have in an organization, one person will do a mistake. And then the question is, how do you deal with a mistake? Can we learn as an organization from it? And can we make sure that it's not systematic? And systematic we as managers and leaders can influence that, we can change procedures, we can change processes, we can govern them, and we can um, take this topic seriously and not treat it as a compliance topic, which often gets a bit disregarded, though it shouldn't be. Right? We can give people the confidence to step up if they see that something is wrong and act accordingly. And if you've read the news today, you just have a very prominent example of SEP acting very, very consistently and the person involved acting very, very consistently, which has my high respect. So uh, in, in, in the Lycra company, uh, maybe, maybe sort of to touch on one of the challenges of uh, ESG and ESG has been very close to the heart of the Lycra company for many, many years. And about 16 years ago, we put out Planet Agenda, which is really our framework as 
uh, how we're going to move forward with it. But one of the challenges, because there's only a few grams of lycra in your garments, is that we have literally thousands of retailers coming as coming to us because of the due diligence regulations that says you have to look up in your supply chain which is absolutely the right thing to do uh, but there's a lot of waste in there and i think there's an opportunity there for, for for some efficiencies because every retailer has their own processes yes there are some regular there are some uh, sort of aggregators that you can submit your information to and then the the, the retailers can can have a look at uh, you as the company whether you know have you got forced labor do you pay your people do you have excessive overtime you know there, there we have people coming to us every single day asking can we have a half day audit at your manuf at the manufacturing plant and we're literally having to hire more and more people to fill out these questionnaires host the host the audits uh, we've got certification companies that are coming in and asking the same questions that they did the week before. So I think the, the, the legislation is absolutely in the, in, the, in the right place. There's lots of people trying to do the right thing, uh, but they were stuck a little bit in the, in the red tape uh, sit, sit, situation where lots of waste, a lot of people are making money in the, in the middle, uh, offering these audits and certifications. And I think everyone can, everyone can do a much better job there. Yeah, that's a super great point. And if compliance becomes bureaucracy, compliance fatigue kicks in and then it's, the game is over. So maybe a completely different uh, area. I mean, we have to take everyday decisions on third parties, on investments, on M&A, in licensing, take decisions, risk-based, therefore risk management is so important. What about uh, hiring? So, I mean, we train people when they arrive at the company on ethics, compliance, risk management, but what if we would start earlier? So what we are exploring at the moment is we bring ethics questions, dilemmas into the hiring process. Super interesting because normally you check CVs, you check, I mean, experience, but how would a very experienced scientist or saleswoman react? And we try this now out by a surprise if there's suddenly an ethics question in the hiring discussion. So for example, your boss tells you, you have to achieve the numbers, you can't do it, uh, what do you do? Super surprising, interesting. I mean, again, it's it's an early start, but I think when we talk about you know, the ethics forum here and these ethics dilemmas, and if you get people into company, I think we need to start earlier to think, do we as a company make clear for what we are standing and that we want to have the right mindset already in the recruitment process? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so we have a couple of questions, but they are very specific. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone would like to add something more on the general front. We don't have too much time. Any? Okay, so do I put Alexander in a hot seat? <laughs> okay. Um, There's one question. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Which is more general or? Okay, go, go for it. Yeah, first of all, thank you. I think it's very important that, um, oh, by the way, Kushwan Singh, I'm head of Secretariat of the International Partnership on Religion and Sustainable Development, which is attached to the German Development Corporation Agency, GIZ. I think, uh, Alexander, you will know GIZ from your colleagues. Um, my question is, first of all, I appreciate that you speak up publicly. I think especially for people who are not so experienced and are part of a different world, not of the business world, but speak a lot about business people and especially the pharma industry. Uh, I hear a lot of negative conversations, of course, in private rounds that you are just very greedy and so on. You know all these stereotypes, but it's, I think, very important to speak publicly about such an important issue as ethics. Um, and I applaud Globe Ethics that they invited you because in our context, we speak with religious people, we speak with politicians, but very rarely we speak with those people who really make money. So I think it's, that's very important. Um, one request I have, I think the time is over, but perhaps afterwards, it would have been very good to hear from a very concrete challenge you had in your company where you had to make a decision. I think, um, Klaus, you referred to dilemma. You have dilemmas, but at the end of the day, the um, people in the management need to take a decision. 
And what were situations where you, th where you said, actually, we could have earned a lot of money, but we did not go for it? How did you make it transparent? What was the communication? And what were the learnings for the next generation of, of managers? That is what I'm interested in. And then I have a very specific question. So I will come to this later on to SAP, but it's related to ethics. We need to, we must work with SAP in our company. Um, and that process started, I don't know, 20 years back. It feels a bit like a, a code I must wear, and now if I want to get rid of the coat, uh, it's so heavy that I cannot actually get rid of the coat. And then you come and the salesperson come and say, yeah, of course, there are a lot of other products. Feel free to go for another product. But um, actually, it's very difficult if you have 30,000 employees to change the whole system. We are now updating the SAP thing. I do not want to tell you what's going on in our company. So it feels like the code is there for all of your life and you come and you say, I can give you a new uh, button here and there, but actually you cannot get rid of the code. So it's also a question of the business model being so like monopolized where I think, okay, going for open source, is it really an alternative? I know it it's, might be a bit unfair, the question, but it just came up to my mind. Thank you. It's a question I receive very often. Uh, happy to discuss that later with you. Just let me say, if you put many things in your code, your code gets heavier. <laughs> okay, unless, unless someone else wants to say a final word, but we are past time. <laughs> no, we're good. Okay, so um, thank you very much <laughs> for this interesting discussion. And, uh, Thank you for the audience.